Show love without pretending. Don't like evil and hold on to what is good. Love each other like you love your family. Be the best at showing respect to each other. Be enthusiastic. Be on fire in the spirit as you serve the Lord. Be happy in your hope. Stand up for yourself when you're in trouble and devote yourself to prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people and welcome strangers into your home. Bless people who harass you. Bless them and don't curse them. Be happy with those who are happy and cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as equal and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think that you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone for their evil actions, with evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good. Don't try to get revenge for yourself. Wait, that's, if possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. Don't try to get revenge for yourselves, but leave room for God's justice. It is written, revenge belongs to me, I will pay it back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. By doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire upon his head. Don't be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. I thank you. That was awesome. Um, it's time for our children and youth to move out of the sanctuary and into their groups. They're going to be exploring what it means to serve and coming up with ideas that they can implement on Serve Sundays, which are the fourth Sundays of every month. And I'm excited to see what they have in mind. I have to tell you, I planted the seed that washing cars in the parking lot during church would be my favorite way they could serve. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, my car doesn't get washed very often. I'd like to start by thanking our first through 12th graders who were our scripture readers today and their parents for making my plan come to fruition, and I know parents that that's not always an easy thing to do, to talk your kids into being front and center in the worship service. So I want you to know how much I appreciate um, your making that happen. The subtitle for the scripture that our children read is The Marks of the True Christian, and I thought that having our children reminds us what it means to be Christian, might inspire us today. If you listened closely, you'll find that in this scripture, being Christian is all about being in relationship, being loving, caring, respectful, enthusiastic, happy, confident, caring, blessing, humble, peaceful, and good. These are all ways of being in relationship. Could it be, I wonder, that one needs to be in relationship in the world to become truly Christian? For while I can be a hermit, I might actually enjoy being a hermit, and be happily content and peaceful and loving, I'm passive and my take 
on being Christian is that it is very, very active. How am I out in the wider world where life happens? Can I meet each day, each person, each situation and live out what being Christian asks of me? I ask this knowing that it doesn't take much to throw me for a loop. I can lose it while driving from Longmont to Boulder with other drivers who have seriously done nothing wrong but drive too slow on Highway 36. <laughs> In a sermon a while back, I told you about my practice of acknowledging, oftentimes repeatedly, that every person, no matter how annoying they are to me, is a child of God. This is my mantra that I practice and which some of you have told me that you now practice. And when I feel my blood pressure starting to rise and I'm starting to curse under my breath, or loudly if I'm alone, to remind myself that the person to whom I'm directing my anger is truly loved by God. Therefore, I'm asked to love them as well. That is a very big part of my becoming. For I'm always becoming Christian. Being Christian for me is a continual path of learning, being tested in new and often interesting ways, and finding new ways to meet the challenges. But the test always comes in relationship. Whether the other person or persons are in the room with me or not, my growth as a Christian is in how I meet the world and how I respond to it. When I was hired here at First Congregational Low those 19 years and two months ago, I was living in a two-room cabin in Netherland alone where I lived for eight years. Those years were healing years for me. My girls had both graduated from high school and were living on their own, and I could finally explore who I was as a widow, living alone, and yes, exploring my relationship to God. And those years were deeply spiritual for me. But when I applied for this job, the chair of the search committee said to me, as he offered me the position, we think that you, maybe your faith journey might benefit from including a few more people. <laughs> and so it has. Indeed, it has in ways you can't begin to fathom. In truth, to truly discover who we are, we need to be connected to other people. We need to be in community. To discover how we meet the mark as Christians, we need to be in community. Being Christian is an ever-evolving act of becoming. It can be messy, it can be beautiful and scary and uplifting and earth-shattering and difficult and depressing. All those marks of the true Christian are theoretically exactly what we would like to be, to be Christian. The reality is, well, perhaps it's time to confess to you that I am not a perfect Christian. I try very, very hard to be the best role model I can possibly be for your children and youth. But out in the real world, I miss the mark more often than I wish. Usually, I can catch myself missing the mark and pull myself back, but certainly it isn't always my first response. I have to pull out my mantra more often than I'd like. And to find real love, not just pretend, as Maeve reminded us, wow, that is so hard sometimes. I have to ride on God's coattails and say to myself, God loves this person and asks me to love this person. Oh God, please help me to love this person because I can't understand how you love them. <laughs> And yet, in community, together, perhaps we can forgive and love them. This week, there was a bombing in New York City. There was a mass shooting at a mall outside of Seattle. 
Two black men were killed by police in Charlotte, North Carolina and Tulsa, Oklahoma. As I sat down to write my sermon, I asked myself if I could take the easy way out and not mention them. But this is the messy, difficult part of becoming Christian. How are we called to respond? When we become so desensitized to violence, what should we do? And I read the scripture again. Show love without pretending. Don't like evil and hold on to what is good. Love each other like you love your family. Be the best at showing respect to each other. Be enthusiastic. Be on fire in the spirit as you serve the Lord. Be happy in your hope. Stand up for yourself when you're in trouble and devote yourselves to prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people and welcome the stranger into your home. Bless the people who harass you. Bless and don't curse them. Be happy with those who are happy and cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as equal and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think that you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone for their evil actions with evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. And don't try to get revenge for yourselves, but leave room for God's justice. It is written, revenge belongs to me. I will pay it back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. By doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire upon his head. Don't be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. And what does it look like to live those passages? A quote from the Lancaster, Pennsylvania blog. It will be 10 years in October that the Amish school shootings occurred. 10 young schoolgirls were killed in a one-room Amish school in October of 2006. Reporters from throughout the world invaded Lancaster County, Pennsylvania to co cover the story. However, in the hours and days following the shooting, a different and unexpected story developed. In the midst of their grief over the shocking loss, the Amish community didn't cast blame, they didn't point fingers, they didn't hold a press conference with attorneys at their side, Instead, they reached out with grace and compassion toward the killer's family. The after, oh, it's a pain to be emotional. <laughs> uh, the afternoon of the shooting, an Amish grandfather of one of the girls who was killed expressed forgiveness toward the killer, Charles Roberts. That same day, Amish neighbors visited the Roberts family to comfort them in their sorrow and pain. Later that week, the Roberts family was invited to the funeral of one of the Amish girls who had been killed, and Amish mourners outnumbered the non-Amish at Charles Roberts' funeral. It's ironic that the killer was tormented for nine years by the premature death of his young daughter. He never forgave God for her death. Yet after he shot 10 innocent Amish girl, schoolgirls, the Amish almost immediately forgave him and showed compassion toward his family. In a world at war and in a society that often points fingers and blames others, this reaction was unheard of. Many reporters and interested followers of the story ask, how could they forgive such a terrible, unprovoked act of violence against innocent lives? The Amish culture closely follows the teaching of Jesus, who taught his followers to forgive one another, to place the needs of others before themselves, and to rest in the knowledge that God is still in control and can bring good 
out of any situation. Love and compassion toward others is to be the life's theme. Vengeance and revenge is to be left to God. More recently, on June 17, 2015, at Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, nine members were shot and killed as the result of a hate crime. Three months later, the Reverend Norval Groff Sr. told the congregation that he is often asked why so many members of the church have been able to forgive. He said, members deal with their grief and everything else by living one day at a time. We've been preaching about forgiveness in Sunday school and in Bible study. He said, we do it because our God commands us to love your neighbor as yourself. Our faith is stronger than fear. We still have the audacity and temerity to believe that love overtakes hate. Now, did I try to find love for the shooter in Seattle, or the bomber in New York, or the police in Charlotte and Tulsa? No, I'm afraid I missed that mark, but I did pray for them and their victims, and I asked God to help me understand how we can bring good out of these daily tragedies. As these examples of two very different Christian congregations show, I truly believe that together we're stronger than the sum of our parts. That's part of what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. And that's what we are. Together, we can become stronger, more resilient, more loving, more caring, more compassionate, more willing to fight evil with good, with love. It is in the continual becoming that we can claim to be Christian, to be members of the body. Together, purposely, we celebrate, enjoy baptisms and marriages. Together, in our grief, we remember and celebrate the lives who have passed. Together, in community, we watch our babies grow into beautiful young adults. How many times, Alma, where are you, Alma? How many? <laughs> have you watched confirmation or youth services or knitted a senior blanket and remembered teaching those pre-K and elementary? Often, because Alma was and continues to be one of my most dedicated teachers and volunteers. She doesn't teach now, but she subs for me whenever I call her. And she had a part of their becoming. In community, we share the joys and the sorrows and the continuity of life. We care for one another. And we stand together as a beacon of light and hope when the world falls apart around us. Together, we help each other grow in our becoming as we grow as a congregation in becoming Christian. It is what we do in Sunday school, from infancy to graduation. We support the becoming of our children as Christians. It is the one thing that we do better than their soccer coach, or their swim coach, or their dance instructor, or their hockey coach, or all the other extracurricular activities our kids are involved in, which are all great. It is, but it's here that we coach their becoming Christians in community. That's what we do. It is why I get frustrated when I can't find teachers. And I still need three pre-K teachers. Or when the number of kids attending drops because of sports or skiing or a myriad of other things. Because it lessens our community when folks aren't here. And this may shock you, but we miss you. Not in a shaming, shame on you, pointing a finger kind of way, but in the sense that our community doesn't feel complete without you. Each one of you, and in Sunday school, your children, you're important here. You have a place here. You belong here. 
as do your children. In this community, constantly evolving in becoming Christian. And it is up to all of us to discover new and effective ways to be community in a world that is becoming more complex with demands on the traditional Sunday church times. It is time to figure out what an even wider, even more inclusive community looks like without losing what's at the core of who we are. How can you check into church when you're away? How can your children be a part of Sunday school without physically being here? These are answers that I honestly don't have, but your ideas are welcome. Together as a community, we can figure this out because what we do here, it's special, it's needed, because together we hold the hope and the promise of a better world. Shh. <laughs> On this Christian Education Sunday, I'm almost done, I won't cry anymore, I promise. <laughs> On this Christian Education Sunday, I want you to know that in my 19 years here, I have grown as a Christian so much, and I continue to grow, and I continue to become. You have been my guides, my inspiration, my support. Okay, I'm gonna cry again. <laughs> you are family to me and to each other. In community, we witness our lives together. We inspire and encourage each other. We challenge and grow together. And we love and hope and laugh and sing and pray together. We are family. <laughs> and we are family. We are one in the body of Christ. As being Christians, we become Christians together as we try and meet the mark. Amen.